Live from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2016. Brought to you by Mirantis. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Lisa Martin. Hey, welcome back, everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley for OpenStack SV. This is the Cube, Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host, Lisa Martin. Our next guest is Kristen, Christian Carrasco, cloud advisor for CloudGuy.io, um, advisor, CTO, serial CTO, and here at the OpenStack SV, giving the keynote on why OpenStack is failing. Controversial topic when everyone thinks it's thriving. Um, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you for having me. We love the controversy because one, you know, the glass is half full, half empty, but certainly there's right. a lot of believers here. Yeah. And so you have that group think going on, sometimes it could be toxic right. or just good motivation. Right. I actually like the community, I think they're doing well, but you've got a perspective yeah. from the trenches. Share your thoughts right. on why is OpenStack failing? So, um, basically, I, I think it's actually succeeding, but there's a lot of failures out there that are highly publicized, right? And so, we are currently, uh, I'm advising a company and building, are re-architecting their cloud, and they have about half a billion users in this cloud, and in order to, um, go to the next level with their cloud, they had to look at um, OpenStack and definitely the public providers, and uh, we looked at the whole spectrum. In the research that I was doing, there's a lot of failures in OpenStack. People abandoned it, they tried it out, and they left, right? And so, uh, at the keynote that I gave, it was basically summarizing the main points, not all of them, right? It's not going to be concise ever, but the key areas that I'm seeing that are big in, in the industry, why it fails, right? And so, and the main part is, it's not the technology most of the time, it's going to be everything else, basically All right, so take us through some of these, so you agree it's healthy now, somewhat stabilized, OpenStack as a community, right? but the failures are of the deployments. Right. How far back are we going time-wise? So, so, recently failures, going back a year? It, it, it could, it, it's actually, over the past five years, right? So uh, an example that I talked about is dogma, right? Um, it's people develop a view of a, of a technology. They go and they try it out, it's version 0 0.5. And they say, this is terrible, we're never going to use this again because they had a bad experience. That's what happened to OpenStack very early on. It got a lot of press, got a lot of traction. Engineers went and tried it and they hated it and they moved on, right? And we it's still see that. a bad taste that. in their mouth and they make a decision. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, what I call dogmatic tech views, right? Yeah. We develop them, and then we never touch it again because we got burnt, right? Other reasons, 3M PTSD. In my previous couple startups that I've had and exited, were I had PTSD at 3 a.m. because I would get woken up every, every other night because of this, and that's what actually drove me into the cloud, and, or high availability when it was called or distributed so you, computing. So your recovery, must go to the cloud. Exactly. <laughs> that was your detox. That was my therapy, if you will. And so that's why I've, I've been very close with the cloud industry for a long time. And, and I know it can succeed, but yeah. it's just got these issues in there. I think you know we look at failure as, as one of the F words, but I like your spin on, you, you bring advice, basically distilling that down, what you talked about right. this morning. I'd love to get some of that advice for um, not, as you say, it's not a technology problem, it's more dogma, it's PTSD, it's also bad experiences. What is your advice to uh, clients, Tapjoy may be included, in terms of how they particularly hire talent that doesn't come in with those you know, biases, those bad experiences? Do you recommend that they hire talent from different industries, mm -hmm. or talent that's, that's younger, fresher? What's your recommendation there? Right. Um, I think the the cloud uh, operations department, which is really, uh, you have to start with a head of your cloud department. Right. Today those are called either cloud officers, uh, captain of the cloud, uh, chief cloud uh, division manager, cloud whatever jar, you want to yeah. call them. There, there's tons of names. But you need an owner. You need the captain to direct the ship. From there, that captain will look at your business model and make sure that your cloud initiatives align with your business initiatives. That may mean that you have to, uh, for example, in Dropbox's case, go design hardware for your storage or work with a hardware partner. So they brought in hardware people. Uh, other times you may need uh, industry leaders in the cloud 
that are great engineers who are writing code for OpenStack because you need customization. And then for other companies, it may just be people who understand how to scale between public and private simultaneously, right? And so we're seeing that. So it's not, it, there's no one answer, what's the right formula, right. but the one key ingredient is there's, it's not a side project that's owned by your DevOps team, by your IT operations team, or some guy mm -hmm. in the company. It's a head captain of your cloud initiative who will then decide what you is need. Is that a common need. problem with, with those enterprises who have failed? Are you seeing that it's been simply a lack of, of that single point, that cloud captain, that driver? I would say a lot of those failed uh, initiatives were because of not having the right uh, a captain or not having the right captain with experience in the industry. And talk to us about what you've done with Tapjoy. You talked about re-architecting that cloud. Right. Was that one of the first places that you started to put that leader in place or uh, what were some of the, the complexities that you've helped them to overcome? Yeah, so the issue was there was obviously, uh, there, was an, there was actually, they made a big investment in OpenStack very early on about two or three years ago. Um, and so they're moving in that direction. but. They didn't fully finish moving in that direction, and now they're exploring, okay, what do we do? What's the next step? That's where I came in, and they actually realized, we do need some help in this. We're, this is not our area of expertise. Let's bring somebody who can advise us and help us build that and, and, and put in place. So, you know, there is, uh, the architecture includes both public, private, and having the right team. Uh, we're looking at hardware stuff. We're working with several people from here and working with uh, managed services. Right, in, in Tapjoy's case, they're not really going to build out an entire engineering team. They're actually going to outsource some of that, right? And so it's going to be a mixture, right? That's what they found was the best fit for them. And um, there's tons of companies that can help out and fill in all that, the, all those gaps, right? So I got to ask you about some of your philosophies on cloud. Obviously, right. um, got a good view on it. You've been there. <laughs> Almost right. as a way to kind of, hey, I'm done. I got enough scar tissue on the, right. uh, the on-prem stuff, but cloud obviously has a lot of benefits, but it's growing. Right. You coined the term, I won't, maybe you did or not coined the term, hyper-converged cloud. Right. So we love hyper-converged. We've been covering hyper-converged storage networks uh, right. with our Wikibon team. What is hyper-converged cloud? Can you explain the right. concept and where does it fit in for the future? Yeah, so I think, um, and, and I purposely grabbed the hyper-converged, the first half of that, um, and put the cloud in it. Uh, the message that I want to portray is we've got to get out a little bit out of the weeds, we've got to go a little bit higher. Let's look at the entire cloud picture, all, you know, virtualization, Docker, uh, OpenStack, Googles, the Amazons, everybody. Let's get together and converge it completely. And when we converge it completely, we're talking about your cloud, not their cloud. We own the IP, right? And then we can power that cloud with any provider we desire with. So right? create it, a centralized Uber cloud, for lack of, not I won't say Uber, but a mega cloud the customer owns, using a power source, if you will, compute source from whatever provider yeah, might, it, more from, of like a, Amazon could be pitching right. in connected to it. Yeah, more from the IP perspective. It's not really, it's, there's no compute within it. So I'm looking at your cloud as almost like a brand, right? Uh, your cloud. Uh, what happens right now, you go to a public cloud provider, and you put in all their services and you're tied into their, uh, in, in, their, in your side your software application code is their DNA, right? You can't pull the, your cloud out of there. So is that really your cloud? If no. it was your cloud, you, you'd be it's able Roche to pull Cotel. it up. You can check in, but you can't check out. Exactly. <laughs> and so, um, so the, the goal is, let's get everybody together, right? And create standards, interoperability standards. And I, the reason I believe that's a success to the next generation cloud is because we go back in history and we look at other successful technologies. And for example, the PC industry, what happened with the PC when they standardized interoperability between competitors? Well, it exploded and it became a household so device. So this concept really puts the customer's IP as the driver, not the follower Correct. to somebody else. Correct, So yeah. that, they forced the interoperability almost reversing the psychology on the provider saying, if you want my business, right. you have to interoperate. Exactly, right, and it creates a better market, more competition, better services. Uh, what, what I believe that's happening yeah. to in, in the cloud industry, they're niche providers. So they're not competing with the Amazons and the Googles or the OpenStacks, they're saying, 
we'll plug in this particular service that we can do really well in our cloud mm -hmm. with our technology and put it, plug it into your cloud and you can enhance it, right? So who's doing this right now? Do you have any examples? I mean, we yeah. interviewed um, um, on theCUBE a company right. that has a global cloud contract. Right, well, what I, I, so yeah, there, there's, the one that I just, I, I looked at, and I thought it was a pretty cool idea, it's uh, Machine Zone. Uh, they do gaming, they're a gaming company, or I think they're relabeling, they're, they're rebranding themselves, um, and they launched a, what they originally called a cloud service using their real-time engines, right? Like the real-time computing. I'm probably going to butcher what their uh, real uh, definition is, but it's basically real-time computing, real-time engines um, for their gaming platform. That is an awesome service that you could use for other gaming devices, right? Uh, other gaming companies could really bring that in and put it inside their cloud or their devices, whatever that may be. However, I think they're thinking even bigger than that, right? And they're looking at other industries that can benefit from real-time computing. So real-time computing is very difficult to do, and they've somehow mastered it and figured out a way to monetize it. So they're, they're putting that. So they're not competing against Amazon, they're not competing against OpenStack, they're not competing against the traditional cloud, public and private clouds, they're just enhancing it, right? And monetization is actually one of the things that we talked about yesterday, John, is, is where uh, OpenStack and, and the open source community is now. We talked with some guests yesterday who are figuring out new monetization streams. But I'm yeah. curious, in terms of business impact, can you expand a little bit more on uh, re-architecting TapJoy's cloud, they're uh, a mobile app company. What's right. the business impact, the business value that TapJoy is getting from right under the hood re-architecture. What's right. that impact so, that they're making? Actually, there, there's several impacts to TapJoy that a re-architecture like this would um, ha uh, benefit them. Uh, a lot of times people dismiss the fact that it's OpenStack is actually less expensive. That's a huge benefit. It, I mean, you know, it's, we, we dismiss it because engineers don't really care about the financial cost, but at the end of the day, the company's in, business to make money, right? And so that's a huge impact, right? But we also have to uh, look at other areas like um, engineering, right? Uh, if you own your cloud, the flexibility to do other uh, technologies and, 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 and customized technologies, the fact that OpenStack is customizable, you, it's, it opens up New endless opportunities, okay. right? It, and they have the engineering resources to modify and create whatever they want. So that opens up a slew of possibilities. And then finally, we look at, uh, again, Machine Zone as an example, and we look at what they're doing, and Taptoy could also position themselves to grab a particular piece of technology that they're good at eventually, and also start offering a service, right, and become in there. And that, that's well, obviously- I mean, the microservices is just an opportunity for them not to have to build software if they can just get it from somebody else, right. either from APIs or right. whatever. So, yeah, correct. I mean, there's tons of opportunities. So, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. Um, and again, it's not about just a private versus public, because we will need both always. All companies will always need both. It's, a, it's, a, it's about positioning yourself to have the flexibility to turn and respond to the market demand. Right, and be able to be, you know, reduce costs, to be able to focus on customer acquisition, right. customer satisfaction, and gaining share. Exactly, yeah. All right, Christian, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE, and congratulations on a great talk. I want to give you. him a plug up, because he's got a new Twitter handle, he only has seven followers, so <laughs> Thank if you're you. watching this, follow Christian on Twitter. It's the Twitter handle, cloudguy underscore io. The thanks. cloudguy io, and uh, great concepts. Love the hyper-converged topic. I think that's a great trend. I think Thank you're right you. on the money on that one. I Appreciate think that it. is a good future. It's essentially a data center in the cloud with right. new services, kind of SLAs could be built into it. Exactly. And the bigger players certainly, I think, would go to that model. I mean, it makes a lot of, and basically it's hybrid cloud. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> it's hybrid cloud as a product that we can't say is a product yet, so. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. Christian, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate it. This is theCUBE live in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier with Lisa Martin. This is theCUBE, you're watching live in Silicon Valley. We'll be right back with more after this short break.